Yeah, I watched half of Anger Management last night. You got a problem? I had 90 minutes of YouTube-related work to do, so I did it. I needed a bad movie to put on the other monitor, and I found one real quick. It was one of the top 10 most popular movies on Canadian Netflix. It's shit. Yeah, it's really bad. It's not good. There's nothing else to say about that, really. It's kind of crazy that it's one of Jack Nicholson's, like, last five movies. How do you feel about Mean Girls? I mean, Mean Girls is a... That's a good movie. Although I will say I saw the tweet that said, like, if Clueless is the definitive coming-of-age movie for the 90s and Mean Girls is it for the 2000s, what is it for the 2010s? I'm sorry to inform you. I take issue. Maybe I'm being heteronormative here, but it's just my opinion... The preeminent coming of age movie of the 2000s is actually super bad. I'm sorry to tell you that. I'm, mean Girls is a great movie as well. For me, it's absolutely super bad, though. The movie speaks to the graduating from high school in the mid 2000s experience one to one. Now, I never changed my name to McLovin or got kidnapped by a couple police officers or forced to sing the Guess Who to. My cousin's friend in a, these eyes, do 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 do, cry every night. It's a great movie. <clears throat> it was, it, why'd you change your name to McLovin? It was either that or Muhammad. Why would that, why couldn't you just pick a common name? Uh, Muhammad is the most common name on earth. You, you read a book sometime. Oh man. What about the 2010s? I don't know, like, I'm not an Olivia Wilde stan. I really enjoyed Booksmart. But a Lady Bird is a better movie, but Booksmart is also pretty good. I guess I haven't seen that many coming-of-age movies in the 2010s, though, because I was already of age. Also, uh, D.L. Guiga, come on. Lost in Translation? Wait, coming-of-age movie? Lost in Translation? You know, coming-of-age is like when you are, are surrounding your 16th to 18th birthdays. That's a coming of old age movie. It's like what it means to be 63 years old. It's a great movie, don't get me, I love Lost in Translation. It's all right. Oh, okay, okay, E underscore D, it's all right. Rotten Tomatoes, Lost in Translation. Let's just take a quick look at what, oh, it's a, it's a mere 95. How about IMDB, Lost in Translation? Uh, Loading, it's loading 7.7 .7 out of 10. Honestly, that's because the average person that uses IMDb to give ratings is uh, like their favorite movie is Zack Snyder's Justice League. No disrespect. Okay, letterboxed, lost in translation. I'm going to say it's a 4.3 or above. 3.9? What's wrong with the letterbox community, man? Excuse me, this is something that needs to be rectified. It's not even a 4 on letterboxed? 3.9 is pretty high on letterboxed. It's one under Rice Boy Sleeps. Don't get me wrong. I also enjoyed Rice Boy Sleeps. I thought it was a great movie, but Lost in Translation is up there too. One and a half. Sofia Coppola, you fucking weirdo. I was really looking forward to this. What do you mean we were really... Try being alive in 2003 when you write this review, you piece of crap. Lost in Translation takes a look at a blossoming love affair between two Americans isolated in Japan. My problem with this is that I found the depiction of Japan and of Japanese people by the film to be dog shit. Like half of the film's runtime is Bill Murray making fun of the fact that the Japanese don't have perfect English, English pronunciation while completely ignoring the fact that they speak two languages while he only speaks one. Bill Murray, uh, you're right, Lost in Translation would have been a much better movie if every time Bill Murray didn't understand someone, he said, just so you know, I'm not making fun of your English uh, for not being good. I am a stupid American who only speaks lo one language and I recognize your polyglot superiority because you're speaking too. I know it's problematic that I don't understand you because of your accent and I apologize, but let's get to the funny parts. When they aren't being used for a cheap, unfunny, racist joke, the Japanese are treated as a plot device. The movie is about a, an American who's 63 years old going to Japan for the first time and experiencing isolation and culture shock combined with the uh, you know, one-two punch of a midlife crisis and uh, imminent divorce of his marriage. Come on, man. Come on, Wait, are we gonna do this? What, what's next? We're gonna leave a, a three and a half star review of um, Forgetting Sarah Marshall that says like, oh, this is a pretty funny movie. Too bad that um, they're 
colonists because they're going on vacation in Hawaii. Like we, we have to do better than this from a criticism standpoint. The, the point of the movie is not that Bill Murray is like a, a good guy. The point of the movie is that he's a normal person, okay? It's the, the movie is not like, hey, check out this cool guy, Bill Murray. If anything, it's kind of that he's, he's a little bit pathetic, quite frankly. Holy cow, man. At the center of the film is the romance between Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson, which I found to be lackluster. I mean, it's obvious why Bill wants Scarlett, but why does she want him? Because she's lonely? Because her husband neglects her? Because he's the only other American in the vicinity? You don't understand. It's not, this is not a, it, it's, the fact is, one of the things that makes Lost in Translation so interesting is the fact that these two people who otherwise would never have had the opportunity to meet meet because of this unique circumstance that they find themselves in being islands of American culture overseas, okay? You don't, and they're, it's not a romance movie. It's like a, a 12-year-old's opinion of the movie to be like, is this a romantic comedy where Scarlett Johansson falls in love with an old man? It's not a romance. They're friends and possibly Bill Murray is trying to propel it forward because he's a bit of a scumbag, but they're, they're companions more than anything else. This is crazy, man. What a bad movie. I'll give it one star just because of Scarlett Johansson. What the hell? Bromidic and f unfunny. Hang on. I'm not in 10th grade English class. I need to look this up. Bromidic. Dull and tiresome, but with pretensions of significance or originality. Okay, I mean, that's fair. I disagree, but I can understand that criticism about Lost in Translation. I mean, a one and a half star review of Lost in Translation means that I'm now going to look at everything you've ever reviewed, though. So if you'll just give me a second here. Let's, let's see what you've been reviewing here. Let's, let's see what you gave. Uh, okay, three and a half star review for Barbie. I haven't seen it, so I can't... Uh, I can't uh, comment on that. I did notice you gave a three-star review to Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, but apparently Lost in Translation is a one and a half. So that's... I, now, let me just say, I understand that um, <laughs> those movies might have different expectations, and as a result, you may be uh, you're more inclined to have a critical gaze for one of them. I'm just saying. I'm just throwing that out there. I see that you've given... Hustle, the Adam Sandler movie where he uh, recruits a basketball player for the Philadelphia 76ers. You've given that a two and a half stars. Okay, now I'm offended because I see that you've given The Gray Man a one and a half. And the idea that The Gray Man and Lost in Translation are equivalent movies is truly insane. The Invisible Man, the, 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 the recurring bit? The Invisible Man, you gave a zero? That's a that's a decent to pretty good horror thriller. That's crazy. Can I? How do I see your review? I don't use this website. How do I see your review? Reviews. Oh, these are just watched. Oh, bro, come on. One and a half star review for Lost in Translation. Three and a half star review for Despicable Me. Good God. Once upon a time in Hollywood, three stars. Despicable Me, three and a half. Are you, am I losing my mind? The Conversation 1974, Gene Hackman, two-star review, narrative greed renders every story beat into a dull thud, uninteresting? Why, you're not ready for these movies! Go, go follow up Despicable Me with Despicable Me 2, and then you can watch Minions, and then the Despicable Me, The Rise of Groot. This is, this is insanity. I'm sorting by... Highest Rated, Inglorious Bastards, Mission Impossible Fallout, Avatar The Way of Water, Avatar The Way of Water, Avatar The Way of Water, Avatar, Avatar, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and then fucking, of course, number seven with a five-star review, Tokyo Story. I, I find that after three watches of Avatar The Way of Water, Tokyo Story from 1953 really hits the fucking spot. Of course, Kill Bill Volume 1, Avatar, Titanic, Howl's Moving Castle, Spirited Away, In the Mood for Love and Chunking Express, Back to Back, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, four and a half stars out of five. Like, I disagree, but it's not, it's not insanely, ins I'm losing my mind here. Brian De Palma's Blowout, 1981, four and a half stars. Gene Hackman's The Conversation, 1974, two stars? We found a person on the planet who doesn't like 
the conversation, but loves blowout. Pirates of the Caribbean, the curse of the Black Pearl, four and a half stars, man. I'm dying. Lost in translation, one and a half stars. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest, four and a half stars. That's the sequel. Okay, this, the reviews that this person has given me are crazy. It's not Dan, but it is a Dan-esque review profile. Rush Hour 2, four and a half stars. Am I, am I losing my mind? Ru Rush Hour 2? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? That is it. She, she did the, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Lee! Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of... <laughs> sorry. There's a lot of good movies. What? Is that... Uh, is that Carter? I don't know what she's talking about. She just said, did you block me? There's a lot of good movies here in the, in the four to five star queue, but there's a lot of great movies in the one star queue. I love, dude, I think I don't understand film talk and that's fine. You can keep it up. But this person strikes me as being 19 years old. There's nothing more 19, and, and if you're 19, if you, I was here too, okay? But there's nothing, nothing more 19 years old than like knowing the language that you use to talk about movies that are good and then applying that language to like the biggest fucking broad appeal blockbuster that's literally just designed for you to go see in a movie theater and forget about two seconds later. Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End, four stars out of five. These have always been a little clunkily, or a little clunky tonally, and this is no exception. But that's also what enables them to try lots of crazy things. So true. I believe that's what Roger Ebert said about Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. Come on, I'm, I'm, hang on. I, we should get started here, but I want to find something that really offends me. I want to I want to find like an absurd movie with a four star plus to make me feel okay. I'm a little upset that I see that the thing got a four stars. Pirates of the Caribbean three got a four and a half, but whatever, whatever. Everybody makes mistakes. I'm sure if you if if I reviewed every movie uh, I ever saw, you would probably find contradictions like this in my own filmography as well. But uh, Rush Hour two four stars. They reviewed it two times and gave it two different scores, but they. The Batman, 2022, four-star review, two words, aesthetic mastery. I'm not going to lie. This is pretty much what my letterbox account would look like if the website had existed when I was 20 years old. It's all like superhero movies and then extremely critically acclaimed Japanese cinema and Wong Kar Wai movies. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't know why you're hating on them. I'm hating on them because they gave Lost in Translation a one and a half stars. But then they gave Spider-Man 3 a 4 stars. This is crazy and has some of the funniest scenes of the series. Crowded, chaotic, fast-paced often makes no sense, but it doesn't need to. Spider-Man 3? 4 stars for Spider-Man 3? One and a half stars for Lost in Translation? 4 stars for Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings? One and a half stars for Letterboxd? One star for Secretary starring Maggie Gyllenhaal? And James Spader, that's at least a three-star movie. Come on. One star for Secretary. One and a half stars for Step Brothers. Okay, based. One and a half stars for The Suicide Squad? Not Suicide Squad. The Suicide That's a good movie. I'm losing my mind. <laughs> Two stars for Space Jam and New Legacy. One and a half stars for Lost in Translation. <sighs> Not, not just one and a half stars. They called it bromidic and unfunny. Two stars for Lara Croft Tomb Raider. Two stars for fucking Red Notice. Whose reviews are you reading? Just a completely random person who their score offended me. <laughs> their score for a movie I like offended me on a deep level. Two and a half stars for fucking Road to Perdition. What is wrong with you? Get it. Get it. Two, same, same review for Road to Perdition as Jungle Cruise 2021. In 10 years, your reviews are going to be incredible, though. Right now, you got, you got the tools, but you don't know how to apply the tools in the toolbox. Once you learn how to apply the tools in the tool toolbox, oh, man, you might, you're going to be the top letterbox reviewer of all time. And when you do that, please revisit Lost in Translation. Just because you're... It, it only seems bromidic because you're 20 years old, okay? So any movie that doesn't have someone with a lithium reactor in their chest... 
is taking itself too seriously by definition. Once you get some life experience, the experiences of other people's lives will be easier to empathize with, okay? Not everyone you disagree with is 10 years younger than you. That's the charitable read, Gagi, because they gave Spider-Man 3 a four stars. They gave Spider-Man 3 four stars out of five. Then it, that may not offend you. You might be like, it's a pretty okay movie. Yeah, but they gave it the same score they gave Spider-Man 2. Can you take this person seriously? You might be like, if, it, here's what I'm going to say. For you, me to take you seriously, you got to give Spider-Man 2 and, Spi and Spider-Man 3 at least a one-point gulf between them. They call them the dulls. They're anything but. Don't, don't even get me started, okay? We just went on a psychotic parasocial read of Letterboxd. We went through somebody's entire letterbox profile. I got very upset because they gave Lost in Translation a one and a half stars, and they gave um, the second Pirates of the Caribbean movie four and a half stars. They gave it half a star less than they gave The Godfather. But they thought that Pirates of the Caribbean 2 was better than The Thing. I'm just, listen. <laughs> I'm over it. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe. I short-circuited my own brain because I was gonna ask who that song was. But then while I um, was gonna ask, I realized that I knew who it was. That's Machine Head by Blur. And then I was going to say, remember when they had that in that pivotal basketball scene in Beef? And we were just going to keep spiraling off of that. But we got we to gotta move on. Okay, $248 billion is a pretty sizable amount. Of, sorry, Bush, Bush, not Blur. Not, not Blur, Bush, Bush, not Blur. Damon Albarn, Chibli, Damon Albarn, Gavin Rosdale, Gavin Rosdale, Bush not Blur, Damon Albarn, Blur not Bush, people, Blur not Bush. We love Blur, we like Bush okay, but we love our Blur, don't we people, don't we? I know they were rude to Nardwar, he's a weird little guy, I'm not saying he deserved it, but in many ways he didn't. They apologize later, now we can listen to Park Life Without Guilt, can't we people, can't we? Um... I, lo I lost it at the end. Um, <laughs> Palm Oil tells me this is, I want to say this is Southeast Asia, but $248 billion seems like, I mean, that's like a half of the UK's total exports, right? They, they were around like 450 or something like that. So that's a lot. I don't know. Is there any country in Southeast Asia that exports $248 billion? I'd have to think about it. For, you know, just give me a second here to think about this. Rubber, soap, ammonia, ferro alloys, coal briquettes, lots of mining. Mining tends to indicate mountains, if my um, Minecraft is correct. This might seem like a crazy start. I'm going Indonesia. Or the Philippines, maybe? The Philippines don't seem that mountainous in my head, but I don't know. I'm fucking crazy. <laughs> I'm insane. <laughs> I will say, when I think of palm oil, for whatever reason in my head, I think of Indonesia. So apparently that's something that is, is never going to unstick. Holy cow, that felt amazing. By, okay, sorry, I'm getting so sidetracked. I was going to say palm trees made me think of Southeast Asia, but they got palm trees like all over the world when, it's, when the climate is appropriate. But can I tell you something? I saw a thread on Reddit this morning while I was having a bowel movement. Why did you need to know that? Because I didn't want you to think I was using valuable like free time to go on Reddit, okay? I was just on the toilet. That's what it deserves. Now, one of the threads that I saw was like, what it, as a tourist, what is one of the most overrated cities you've ever been to? The first, I've never felt this vindicated in my entire life. You can go look up the thread and, and validate what I'm saying. I'm not making this up or exaggerating. Number one was Miami. And then the second comment was like, Miami is one of those cities where when I went to, it was like the same thing that I said the other day verbatim. I went to it and I was like, I get it, but I don't think I would survive here because it's just like a different sort of, they seem to value different things, at least in the tourist area of Miami. Uh, than, than I do in my personal life. Number two through seven were all people saying Orlando. I swear to God, they were like, I went to Orlando and I literally don't understand it. The water tastes like shit. It's a swamp. The weather is absolutely horrendous. And I felt the most vindicated I've ever felt in my entire life. Someone said, 
Orlando straight up has the rudest people I've ever met in my entire life. And I was like, thank you. Because sometimes I'll finish a stream and be like, I went off a little too hard on Orlando. I'm sure there's people that live there that are like, that's not true. And they're offended. But then to see another person be like, they're, everybody that I met in Orlando is rude. I was like, I appreciate that. Because I thought that maybe I was crazy. By the way, I do have to say, congratulations to um, Jennifer Lawrence on the release of No Hard Feelings on digital. It's also on Prime Video. The person on Letterboxd who gave Lost in Translation a 1.5 gave No Hard Feelings a 3. So I think that you could just put that on the cover. Two times as good as Lost in Translation, which may have won Best Picture in 2003. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, Christopher Nolan, Lucius, I Bought the Airline. Isn't I Bought the Airline from Dark Knight? Anne Hathaway was Catwoman. I Dreamed a Dream. This is from The Matrix. <laughs> I Dreamed a Dream and now that dream has gone from me. I Dreamed a Dream musical. Sock. Musical. I Bought the Airline. I think it animated Fox Lucius for some... I don't know what this is, but I knew it was together. Is it the Fox and the Hound? No. <laughs> oh, maybe Lucius has nothing to do with it. Damage. Hunting. Hunting, hound, fox. Animated. Sock, elf, Lucius. Time is a, is a song from the Inception soundtrack. Maze. Diary. I bought the airline. Is I bought the airline from Inception instead then? It could be Christopher. I dreamed a dream. Inception. I bought the airline. Christopher Nolan. Oh, what have I? Christ Anne Hathaway, Christopher Nolan, Fox. I bought the airline? <laughs> Time? No, I dreamed a dream. No. I'm washed, man. Lucius. Maze, Christopher Nolan, time I bought the airline. Two swaps left. We're not making it. I'll tell you that much. Anne Hathaway, she's been in a musical. She's, Anne, Anne Hathaway's been in The Princess Diaries. The, Anne Hathaway was in Les Miserables. Oh my God, we made it. And what the hell is Sock Lucius Elf Diary, dude? The fact that I got five is insane because I... I don't know what I'm doing here. Sasha Baron Cohen is in Les Miserables. Sock Lucius Elf Diary is Harry Potter. That's a blind spot for me. This is Inception. This is The Fox and the Hound. And this is The Dark Knight Rises. I would like to give this puzzle a, a zero because I didn't do well in it by my own personal standards. But I don't think that's fair. <laughs> Dirty Harry to Back to the Future 3. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to send it. Uh, I know that Clint Eastwood was in Dirty Harry. And I know that Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd and um, Ted Danson's wife, Mary Steenburgen, are in Back to the Future 3. So we're going to go Clint Eastwood. Then we need to jump to comedies. So we're going to go straight to Space Cowboys from the year 2000. That gets us access to a, a number of actors that you may or may not be familiar with here, such as John Hamm, who I had no idea was in that. Now, Jay Leno, really? Probably playing himself. Did you hear about this? They're sending four old guys into outer space. I would like, personally for me, I would like to connect to The Addams Family because it's the first movie I ever saw in theaters. I got a lot of nostalgia for it as a result of that, okay? So who's in The Addams Family? The tall guy from Twin Peaks plays Lurch. Raul Julia, taken before his time, so we're not going to find many easy connections unless we go to Street Fighter somehow from all these Oscar-nominated actors. Uh, Angelica Houston, Christopher Lloyd, Dan Hedaya, of course, uh, perhaps most famous for uh, Blood Simple or being the father of the Butabi brothers in Night at the Roxbury. But you know what? Let, let's go through movies we talked about recently. Let's go James Cromwell, and we'll take that straight to... Um, L.A. Confidential. Excuse me. Thank you. And hang on. I was like Guy Pierce, Prometheus. 
alien universe somehow gets us to the alien resurrection, which has Dan Hedaya, which then takes us to the Adams family. <laughs> what a cast, man. Are you seeing this cast, by the way? Russell Crowe, Guy Pierce, Kevin Spacey, Kim Basinger. She, listen, Kim Basinger won um, Best Supporting Actress, I think, for LA Confidential. No disrespect to Kim Basinger. She, one of the weakest actors in the whole film. That's saying something. I'm not trying to be a hater, but like she won the Oscar that year. And she's getting outacted in every single scene. No disrespect. Danny DeVito, James Cromwell, David Straytharn. Who the heck is David Straytharn? Shut your mouth, you damn Beltaloda. This guy, look, you, you didn't know his name was Ron Rifkin, but when you saw him in the movie, you were like, that's, I know that guy. That's Bob Balaban. And I say, shut your mouth. They think that's Bob Balaban, you piece of shit. That's Ron Rifkin. All right, anyway. This guy was born to play a scumbag in a movie about the 1950s for sure. Okay, regardless. <laughs> Adam's family. I almost feel like I, here, I need to go Guy Pierce, and I'm sorry. I need to go like Prometheus. And then I need to find an actor from Prometheus who's also in the other Alien movies, which doesn't really make sense because he tried to tell us, Ridley Scott tried to tell us that the movie does not have a connection to Alien, which is obviously insane. Maybe there's a cameo somewhere in there. <laughs> now you got to get to Lost in Translation because you were talking about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now you got to get to Lost in Translation. Okay, that's easier than you would think, probably. No, it's really easy. You want to get to Lost in Translation, you go Logan Marshall Green, who's in Spider-Man uh, Homecoming, which then takes you to Tom Holland, which then takes you to um, any Avengers movie which then takes you to Scarlett Johansson, which then takes you to Lost in Translation, okay? Now that you're at Lost in Translation, a mere 1.5 star movie, apparently, according to some people on uh, Letterboxd. <sighs> Where was I trying to get again? <laughs> Michael J. Fox. Christopher Lloyd, Christopher Lloyd. Who framed Roger Rabbit? Who framed Roger Rabbit? I don't know, but I know that it has Bob Hoskins in it, who was also in the Super Mario Brothers movie with Dennis Hopper, who was in Speed with Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves, of course, the John Wick films. So all we need to do is find a movie that uh, Rina Sawayama and Bill Murray were both in, and then we've got our connection. Giovanni Ribisi. You got a lot of good stuff with Giovanni Ribisi. You got uh, Gone in 60 Seconds. You've got... Um, he, actors who look like they should have been on succession but were never on succession it's so true you've got um, Boiler Room starring Ben Affleck and Vin Diesel and of course Giovanni Ribisi and am I crazy am I crazy to think that this also has the dude from L.A. Noir? just give me a second here you're gonna take me back to Giovanni Ribisi and you're gonna follow that to Boiler Room was your dad played by the same dude it was played by the same dude that's a Ron Rifkin classic right there Okay, let me think about this for a second, okay? Now, if we're trying to take, <laughs> take ourselves back to, to the Adams family, we've got to find a way to get into the 1980s. We can do that via Ben Affleck. That's going to take us to Dazed and Confused. From Dazed and Confused, we're going to find some certified 80s classics here. Here's what I'm thinking, all right? Let me, let me think about this one for a moment. What a cast. What a cast. Parker Posey? We can go back to the 80s with Parker, Parker Posey. Don't we have like Problem Child or something? Give me a second here. What's, what's that first Parker Posey movie called? What's that big Parker Posey, Posey movie from the early 1990s? Party Girl. Not Problem Child. Okay, we could go to Coneheads. From Coneheads, I mean, you could get to anywhere from here. This is one of the most star-studded casts I've ever seen in my entire life. We're still dealing with household names all the way down here. Todd Sussman? Whip Hubley? Coneheads is OP, dude. I had no idea. For comedies, at least. 
And yet I still can't seem to find a way to get myself to the Adams family. <laughs> How about Dan Aykroyd? Then you're going to take me to nothing but trouble? From nothing but trouble? You're going to take me to Tupac Sh Shakur? From nothing but trouble, you're going to take me back to Chevy Chase. I think I got to tap out on this one, man. I can't seem to <laughs> get to back to the future. Christopher Lloyd, Bob Hoskins, John Leguizamo, Gamer, 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 Gerard Butler. Okay, hang on. I got to get from Chevy Chase to 300. <laughs> Woo! Okay, how does one do that? Strap in, baby. It's so easy. You know what we have to do? <laughs> You're going to laugh. <laughs> RS, got to get back to Prometheus, man. How did we do that, okay? How did we get to Prometheus? Prometheus was right there. We got to get back to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Scarlett Johansson, and then this guy, Logan Marshall Green. Okay, you ready for this? You ready for this? Chevy Chase to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Vacation. Skylar Gisando's in that movie. Marvel Cinematic Universe. Marvel Cinematic Universe. Chris Hemsworth! Avengers in Infinity War. Spider-Man, Tom Holland. Spider-Man Homecoming. Logan Marshall Green. Prometheus. What the hell was I doing here? Chat, can you remind me where did I, I had to get to Michael Fassbender, who's in 300, with Gerard Butler, who's in Gamer, with John Leguizamo, who's in the Super Mario Brothers movie with Bob Hoskins, who's in Who Framed Roger Rabbit with Christopher Lloyd, who's in Back to the Future 3. Excuse me? Part 3. Time? <laughs> you gotta admit, it took us a while, but... Once I found the connection, I had all the data stored in the cache. You could also just do Clint Eastwood to the outlaw Josie Wales to Bill McKinney to Back to the Future Part 3. But I'm sorry to tell you that in the modern era, nobody watches Westerns. Sorry. But, oh, what about True Grit? Okay, you've seen one Western. Get over yourself. It's a, it's a dead genre. It exists only to subvert itself now. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Bro, fucking take me back. Take me back. You ever think about how crazy it is? That this is just what, like, young lads looked like in 1983? And they were drinking, like, full cane sugar Coca-Cola six times a day? Like, what have they done to us, man? To meet someone... This is just a normal guy in 1983. To meet someone who looks like this now, you would be like, you must have dedicated your life to fitness. This dude is just like, I'm building model rockets with my friends. That one dude's on crutches? Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> am I crazy? To I don't want to get parasocial. He's kind of serving with the length of the shirt, though, is he not? Let's not even talk about the shorts, because that's how I like to wear my inseams, but he's kind of... <laughs> am I crazy, or is he kind of serving with this? Anyway, <laughs> wait a minute. Hey, what are you doing? I didn't even see this part at first. What is he doing? It's disgusting, man. Anyway, this is 1983. It's 1977. What have they done to us? Now, you're going to say that this is, this is me in university right here. There's absolutely, like, I'm looking at this. This is what all of my classmates look like. I had already lost all my hair at this point. Um, but all of my classmates look like this. And everybody dressed like this. These pants, I'm not trying to shame her. This, everyone was dressed, the cool people were dressing like this. When I was in university, all four years of university, women were wearing capris nonstop. I don't think I've seen a single capri pant since like 2013. But capris were going crazy back then. Paper plates, so obviously it's not in the modern era. Lanyard with, look at, look at this shit right here. This is, is there anything more 
college student in the mid 2000s coded than this. <laughs> a lanyard with 90 different keys hanging off of it. Peace sign necklace. Oh man, this is taking me back. I can already tell, I'm glad that you're here because this is probably the coolest dude in the whole dorm. You could, you could just tell from the hair, honestly. And then all these other guys, they want to be him. There's no doubt about it. Um, that was not me, by the way. I was probably... That's more like me right there. So I think this is 2007. 2012? What are they feeding them in Michigan, man? Why did they cut the pizza like that? I mean, you, you raise a good point. You know why they cut the pizza like that? Because they're college freshmen, okay? So, like, some college freshmen still have not gotten to the point where they're eating the pizza crust. So they want the interior slice that doesn't have this yucky part. Nobody tell them the logical solution to this, which is that the whole pizza is made of crust. It's just a Midwest thing. Is it a, do you want a corner or a side? Crust is a waste of calories? No, it's nice bread. You can't do it. It's a false pretense. You can't be like it's a waste of calories and then eat like the interior part of six slices of pizza. It's, it's intellectually disingenuous unless you take your shirt off and you look like the dude who was holding the party hat over his you know what. If you got an eight pack, you can say stuff like that. If you're just like a dude, you can't say that. It's just you're, you're not living true to your values. Uh, POV, you are uh, Lionel Messi playing against every single goalkeeper in the MLS. What is this? <laughs> Why is he behind the goal? Because he got subbed off in the 53rd minute after scoring five goals. This, to me, is 1998 in the north of England. You can't see the guy that's behind my head. But, like, he's, like, I can already tell that he's going, streets like a jungle, so call the police. I'm going to say this is Sheffield, 1997. Young lads playing football nearby to the construction of the Angel of the North. That's in Newcastle upon Tyne. My mistake? Sky, I'll, ne I'll never not laugh just reading. Score some effing goals, man. Oh, man. <laughs> now this, I'm like... <laughs> Oh, I love that. This one's freaking me out, man. Because the camera is from like the mid-1990s. But I don't know if this kind of hairstyle on a dude existed then. Like this is a 2000s era haircut on a guy. But it's also Europe. And I'm just saying like I don't, I don't fully know what was going on. Like I, I, if you showed me this per man right here, this person... I could not tell you what year this is from. Like he's wearing a zip up hoodie, but he doesn't have his arms through the sleeves. That, that he's timeless. That could be at any time in, <laughs> in Earth's history as far as I'm concerned. I have no idea. Um, I'm gonna say this is 1999 in, well, okay, I know it's Europe because it says Paris. I think it says Grenoble. This says, Mets. I mean, I guess it could be Belgium then. Let's just say we're in... Well, if you're in Paris, you're probably not going to Paris. Let's say you're in Brussels then. And it's 1999. A couple in an Avignon train station in the late 1990s. Okay, well, yeah, the year was right. Let's go Mets. So true. Did you see Mrs. Met, by the way? No comments? Did you see her? Do you think you could fix her? A-O. <laughs> Why do hockey players always look like the kind of guys who would play hockey? Okay, listen. <laughs> Brett Hull definitely looks like a guy who would play hockey. Eric Desjardins looks like a guy that would play hockey. I feel like in this picture of Andy Moog, he kind of looks like he could be in like a European pop group with his spouse 
and then like he divorced his spouse and he married the, the spouse of the other person that was in the group. And then that person's spouse married his ex-spouse. Galchenyuk, honestly, he looks like he would be like one of the first 10 employees at Facebook. Chris Pronger, I don't even know what to say because this is just a one of a kind photo. The, the perm or whatever you <laughs> describe the hair as here is just, they don't make them like that anymore. Let's put it that way. Does look a little bit like Peyton Manning. Kyle Turris also looks like he's from the movie Primer. He doesn't look like he's he's a hockey player. He looks like he invented a time machine uh, and used it to go back in time to buy stocks to get wealthy. But instead, for some reason, instead of buying stocks, they just decided to um, I don't know fall in love with like the same girl or something like that, and then. Another dude that is an acquaintance of them shows up in the past at a party and he's like, anyway, Brett Hull looks like he's a little lit. Well, Brett Hull, um, I feel bad saying this because he actually might have like a drinking problem, but he also has the famous quote from like the, the speech from the St. Louis Blues victory parade where he goes, uh, Everybody, nobody in history ever thought that this day would ever end. Well, guess what? It's not gonna end. We don't, everyone says, let's go, Blues. We don't have to go anymore. We went. We went, Blues. We went, Blues. Lamal, no, no, no. Listen, okay, I'm not gonna put the video on screen, but just give me a second here. Giving him a microphone as a <laughs> that, might, that, that might be, be the, the smartest the move of the day. <laughs> Good job who's ever producing the stage up there. By the way, speaking of John Hamm. <laughs> oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. Rick Flair. No one in the history <laughs> could have imagined how this <laughs> ever ends. Oh, man, it gets me every time. <laughs> oh man it's just such a such an unexpected quote <laughs> and guess what it's not gonna end anyway i'm stalling because i don't know what the the heck i'm gonna play man take me to steam maybe today's the day that a new 10 out of 10 in the twin stick shooter roguelite comes out you think how about on guard? The swashbuckler People say action game. I'm a troublemaker. Adelante. <laughs> Your guard's open. Watch out. Okay, this looks cool. Let's do that. 97% of the 174 user reviews are positive. Let me get something out here to celebrate this. This is super slick. The writing, oh no, <laughs> sorry, I'm gonna, I'm not saying anything. The writing, given great breadth with convincing VO, has a high puss in boots type charm. I didn't write it, okay? This has been my most anticipated title from Steam Next Fest and it doesn't disappoint. You can pet the chicken. 80 minutes in and I'm loving the combat. The game is a lot of fun. I've been waiting forever to, for someone to make a game like this. Absolutely glorious. This is a proper Sekiro-like. You learn to parry or you die. Okay, let's, let's give it a chance then. Why not? Well, put the kibosh on that idea. My steam is frozen. How about, well, exit and then re, reopen it. Why do you hate animated movies? Um, because... And it's not the movie's fault, but it's because Twitter thinks that I love animated movies. So every day, or just animation in general. So like every day after nine NBA related like basketball tweets that it serves to me, which I don't even watch basketball either, but then it will serve me like the newest drama about how like people are canceling BoJack Horseman because he, 
I don't even know, honestly. But the Bojack Horseman, he's catching a lot of heat right now for an animated horse. Let me just put it that way. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to boot up Steam. He did a lot of bad stuff. He's a, he's a fictional horse. Hang on, I'm trying. <laughs> I think my computer is getting close. To, I need your help with this one. My computer is getting close to being on its last legs. After like four days of, of being on, the search bar no longer works. Like I, I exited Steam and then I was going to reopen Steam. So I clicked on the start, like the Windows button, and then I typed Steam into the search bar and it just hangs. How, teach me, how do you get to Steam without being able to use the search? Now, I have a folder here called Steam that I can access. But when I click, you'd, you'd think that because I'm apparently I'm old as hell. I wanted to right click on the folder and click um, open file directory. But they don't let people use file directories anymore because people only know how to use uh, tapping icons on cell phones. OK, so instead I can only click on the folder. And then when I click on the folder, it just puts out every game that I've ever played that's not what I want what I want is steampowered.exe and is that in there it is okay I just had to scroll all the way down there we go I was a second away from having to go to the command line but here's the fucking problem when I type cmd into the windows search bar the thing just hangs so they like they're not even allowing me to get to my own command line to actually be able to navigate the way we used to do in the stone age Windows key R, It's a good point. I was born before the Windows key, okay? Do not cite the old words to me, which I was there when they were written. You were literally not there? Yeah, but neither were you. <laughs> Probably. We get it, you're a programmer tech bro? I'm not a tech bro at all. I just, I don't mind that as human computer interfaces evolve, they abstract more and more away from what the machine is actually doing. What I do mind is that there's no, they're making it increasingly difficult to interact with it closer to the way that I used to do it in the 90s, I guess is what I'm trying to say, or the 2000s. Like for, I always want to be able to, I don't mind if now everything is an icon or everything's a shortcut, blah, blah, blah. But what I also want is the ability to right click on something and then go, you know, please open this directory or right click on it and go properties and be able to, you know, tweak the stuff in the settings menu like that. So he hates change. You, you guys, no disrespect, lasagna lover. That's a bad faith read of it. That's just, a, you're just trying to be angry for no reason, even though I'm just making an assumption that you don't need the help. Windows 11 increasingly is, is getting rid of user agency in favor of serving targeted advertisements for no reason. I don't need Windows to tell me the weather. I don't need it to pop up things in my taskbar that are like, um, you know, here's how the Dow Jones Industrial Average is doing today. I just want it to hold my files and then allow me to navigate within that and then like launch the executables as well. I don't mind that they also, you know, they're making it more friendly for the people that didn't grow up, you know, with mouse and keyboard and stuff like that. You know, they're more used to the iPad. That's fine. You know, technology changes. But I just want you to keep like a, an auxiliary option for those of us who have some gray in our beards as well. So patronizing. It's not patronizing. Why are you taking offense to everything? If you grew up using a cell phone, I'm not going to hand you a fucking rotary telephone. I'm going to hand you a cell phone. I'm not going to hand you a, 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 a Viewmaster or something like that and say like, you know, oh, you can't figure it out? The same way, like, you know, I, I know how to use a photocopier. Don't show my ass like a printing press and then be like, oh, you're stupid for not knowing how to use this. The only person who knew how to use it was Gutenberg, man, and he's been dead for like 700 years. Such an out-of-pocket take, LOL. You need to hang out with people that are over the age of 22. Because this is how people respond to criticism is with defensiveness. I get it, because when I was 22, I was hanging out with people that we, you get together with like eight people and you criticize other people that are not in the in-group right now. But you're criticizing me and I can read your comments, so of course I'm gonna respond. And then you're like, wow, ooh, whoa, uh. <laughs> Defensive to my criticism? Bad take.
rip hollow cure, but this game looks pretty fun. Listen, this may or may not be true, okay? But is hollow cure in any way related to the VTuber organization known as Hollow Live? Because if they're not, it is okay. Then I, <laughs> my instincts were correct. What's all this ruckus? It's a fan game. I got nothing against it. I'm just saying, like, uh, it, it didn't find its way into my normal game discovery queue. Yes, but it's lit. Is it a Vampire Survivors clone? Is the Vampire Survivors clone in the room with us right now? That's fine. I'm not insulting it for being a Vampire Survivors game. I'm just, I'm kind of over the Vampire Survivors games, and I don't know anything about VTubers, man. Can I ask, especially Librarian, and I'm not trying to put the whole system on trial. What does it mean when a VTuber graduates? Is that a situation where they've decided to retire or have they been pushed out of their organization, but they call it a graduation? They age out? How do they age out though when they're like, does the person age out or does the robot age out? They don't age out. Okay, never mind. <laughs> but why do so many retire after like a year or something like that? NL out here asking the worst questions ever. Me wondering why, uh, People find my hobby gatekeepy and off-putting. Me asking a simple question about it, this is the worst question ever. Me trying to understand and interface with you on something that we could all relate to. Like, I don't understand. You know, if I ask like a 55-year-old dude with gray hair, what's your favorite part of golf? He doesn't go, it's the worst question ever. He goes, getting away from my spouse for two hours. <laughs> And then we, you know, buy each other a drink and we learn a little bit about life on the other side, right? I'm not trying to actively push people out and then complain about being isolated. I'm trying to find common ground here. I guess here's the question that I have about it. And again, I, that's why I prefaced it by saying this is not mean-spirited. It's just literally coming from a place of complete ignorance. I feel like the most successful VTubers make a lot of money. So I feel like they would want to have relatively long careers from a streaming standpoint. So why do I see VTubers retiring after like two years of insane popularity? It's not something you see with, with meat streamers, you know what I mean? Their contract ended? So the VTuber doesn't own the... They don't own the V. They own the... They're, they're like a, an employee. That's correct. Some of them do. It's very interesting. I'm not, I'm not passing judgment, you know? It's... Uh, you know what's annoying? Is people say, like, that you start getting old and out of touch when you stop making an effort to learn about things. When you make an effort to learn about things, people go, stupid question, boomer. <laughs> I can't wait for you to get your comeuppance, honestly. Did you know there's a male loneliness epidemic? It'll happen to you, too? That's what I'm saying, man! It's so sad how old people don't want to try new things. Hey, hey, uh, that new thing you're interested in, uh, Junior, what is that called again? Oh, Dad, don't talk to me. I told you, it's called VTubing. I told you a thousand times, just leave me alone. You know what? You asked for it. Because you're pressing the parry button. Oh, you know what? <laughs> I'm pressing the Dark Souls button instead of the On Guard button. Hang on, hang on. There we go. Okay, parry should be this. Sprint should be this. Everything else should be the same. Well, jump actually should be this, and dodge should be this. Okay, get ready. Now we're in this is Bloodborne City, baby. If you have Bloodborne controls, you can actually do anything. Use your environment. Stunned enemies will be able to unable to attack for a long time. Some actions will surprise enemies, which stops them for a short time. Okay, ready? Well, I've made a mistake. <laughs> no, I haven't. You're going to die. Okay, the double attack. Pretty solid move. I've broken your guard. You should learn how to dodge. Good dodge. Ooh, I like that animation. Take one of these. Take one of these. They yield. I mashed parry for no reason. Remember, dodge is this. You dodge, then parry, I've been told. <laughs> Note this up. Dodge on, dodge on B. 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 Yes, because you can hold this. And who might you be? Don't show me a tutorial. When you die in the tutorial, you lose twice. Because then you have to see the tutorial again. Go ahead, attack me, please. Bro, there's a certain thing called tempo. I need you to attack me. 
Get splatted. It's a slapstick game. Thank God he got stuck. The other dude got stuck. This is our moment. Mash on him. Splat him. Rumbleverse style wall splat. Okay, okay. Slash moment. It's happening. He made it. Can you believe this? Now these guys are nothing. They literally don't even know how to block. I didn't even know that you existed. Get parried. Okay, we're, we may never get hit again. I was thinking about Rumbleverse the other day. Because, like, the streams have been good. But it's been a long time since I've found a game that, like, really wanted me to play five hours of it per stream. That's why when something like Rumbleverse comes along, you got to savor it, man. We savored it for a while. And then it, <laughs> you know, overstayed its welcome. By the way, get owned. Buy the IP and revive it. Um, I mean, the people who know how to make video games couldn't even make it work, so I don't think I stand much of a chance, honestly. That wouldn't be me. Much like this submersible, I would not uh, die from a fall like that. What is that, a 10-foot fall? No shot. Defeat the enemies. This is no sweat. You're nothing. I've dodged your attack. Good move. Just get hit. That'll stun you. I'll kick you. I'll, ki I'll kick a box into you, and then I'll ruin your life. You got splatted. Holy cow, we healed. <laughs> Just one in a minute, I'm going to figure this out, and I hope you've enjoyed me sucking at this, because I'm never going to get hit ever again after that. You're gonna kick a box? You're gonna kick a box? You're gonna do horrible target selection, but then you have to splat lets you get through one of their poise bars? Ooh! That's an A? Okay, we got lucky. That's- I tried to hit A again. I hit A again. <laughs> Neuroplasticity at an all-time low. Dodge on B, dodge on B, dodge on B. Unbind it? No, 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 no. We'll, we'll do better long-term with the Bloodborne or the Dark Souls style controls, I'm telling you. Didn't this game come out a while ago? It came out in 2011. It was called Dark Souls. Then it came out again in 2012. It was called Dark Souls Prepare to Die Edition. I own you. Then it came out again in 2013. It was called Dark Souls 2. Now that one, we don't talk about that one too much. But then it came out again in like 2018. It was called Dark Souls 3. And we talk about that one a lot because that one is, they, they honestly did a great job with that one yet again. Minus two, Dark Souls 2 is awesome. Unlike you, I've actually played it, so. I haven't seen the video essay that, from H Bomber Guy that redeems Dark Souls 2, but I have played through the entire game about six or seven times. I'm here to tell you from personal experience I would disagree with the academic discourse. If I were in Spain at this time, I would like to think that I would be one of the dudes who has two health bars, not one health bar. That's cope. You don't think I would have two health bars back in the day? You would definitely have one health bar. I think I'd be a two health bar Andy for sure. There's no Peloton in Spain. They have like real bikes over there, I think. Over 30, one health bar for sure. Bro, are you crazy? Here's the thing, I don't dispute the idea that in your 20s, you have a physical advantage. You heal faster, which is essentially the spirit of muscle growth. You basically have a, a Wolverine style superpower there. The problem though is your brain. And I know that like, it sounds insulting, why is it that you can insult my rapidly decaying body and mind, but I can't insult your feeble amount of wisdom and, and being able to organize your life in such a way that it provides you with value, you know? At 20, I had all the advantages for fitness that you could ever imagine, but I was just like, I don't feel like working out this morning. I would rather just lay on my stomach on my bed and watch YouTube videos on my laptop. Now that I'm, you know, I, last night I fell asleep at like 12, 15 a.m., I got up at six, that's five hours and 45 minutes of sleep. You know what I did? At a bowel movement, tortured myself by looking at Reddit for five minutes. Then I got on the Peloton, I did 90 minutes. You know why? Because it's what you need to do in order to 
get done what you want to get done. So I think that if you, I'm just saying in terms of today's society, you know who I think has the most, the most health bars? I think 50 year olds have the most health bars. Nobody scares me more, at least on the Peloton, than like a 52 year old dude in athleisure wear. Every 52 year old dude I see in Vancouver is like the CTO of Hootsuite. He has a, an eight pack and he goes kite surfing like three times a week. They got five health bars. I think 30 year olds have two health bars, people in their 30s. I don't know if I have anything else. <laughs> people in their 20s, I think they could one tap you, but I also think they're, they're kind of glass cannon built. The CEO of Hootsuite is a woman. That's why I said CTO. You think that people in their 50s have more health bars than an NBA player? Are you in the NBA? I doubt it. You're probably like, no, but I'm tall, but you're actually like 6'1", which is not that tall. Like it's taller than I am, don't get me wrong, but like in the whole scheme of things, it's, it's what, like slightly above average? How tall are you? I'm 5'10", but right now you sound like Elon Musk versus Mark Zuckerberg. Suck my tongue. <laughs> I'm gonna drive to Zuck my tongue's house and he's gonna find out why there's uh, weight classes in boxing. The Count Duke is sounding even more dusty Dude's just out on his, uh, his veranda oh, eating good. a meal of fresh goat that he killed himself with his loving family. How much DPS are you doing? Definitely not that much. The reason I play a strength build in these games, whenever given the option, I think is because I've, I've accidentally converted myself to a dex build IRL. I'm a little, I don't want to say envious, but I'm, I'm admirant of the people who, who build strength IRL. My own two cents is just as a normal guy who works, I mean, I don't know what you'd call this job. It's not even like a white collar job. It's like a no collar job. The, the strength build is less practical for me than a, than a dex build. You don't, stop saying you have a wisdom build. You don't, you're starting, you rolled a deprived character. Don't do yourself any favors. Bro, you gotta move, you gotta dunk those. I can't believe anger management is gonna be my new reference. That's like so embarrassing. The movie is not even good. It has no merit at all. No merit, have you seen Marissa Tomei? Yeah, but she's only in the movie for like, Okay, listen, can I say something? You're supposed to root for Adam Sandler in anger management, but he's actually a really bad boyfriend, okay? I'm ignoring the fact, hang on, I'm gonna turn my fan on because things might get a little heated in here. In anger management, Adam Sandler is dating Marissa Tomei, okay? They're, they're going to get engaged. That's like the, the principle of the movie. He has a good job designing clothes for cats who are um, overweight. It's a real market. She's a poetry teacher. This is, this is a two income family that could have made it work in New York City in the year 2003. Do you see how much things have changed? Now, it's so messed up. What, what's the problem? What's the problem with him? She's a poetry teacher. When Jack Nicholson meets Marissa Tomei for the first time, he recites a poem to her and she says, that's my poem. And Adam Sandler says, oh, right, that's your poem. You know I love that poem. And then Jack Nicholson says, I found it crumpled up in Dave's room next to the sports pages. I don't know if that's true or if he made it up. But at the same time, that's messed up, Dave. If that's true, that's messed up. Secondly, there's not really that much more. Well, when he goes to Boston with Jack Nicholson, Jack Nicholson forces him. He basically does force him to go on a date with another woman. He, he, he essentially says, if you don't ask this other woman out, I'm going to write a note to the judge. That means you're going to prison. But that being said, he didn't have to go back to her house. That's something he did of his own volition. I understand he needed a phone book because this is the early 2000s to figure out the address of where his friend was staying. But still, I'm just saying, you could go to a payphone, Adam Sandler. You put yourself in a bad situation. How do you remember this much about the movie? I watched half of it last night. <laughs> when does the realistic depiction of a panic attack set in? Um, 
I would say when Jack Nicholson keeps calling Adam Sandler's boss Fran, even though his boss's name is actually Frank, you could definitely see that that Adam Sandler's character Dave is starting to e experience the most realistic depiction of a panic attack ever put to film. I like the part where Jack Nicholson goes la 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 la. Honestly, I'm not gonna deny it. I would probably get pretty close to having a panic attack if I was driving over a busy New York bridge and then my court-appointed anger management counselor slammed on the brakes in my car and forced me to sing a song from West Side Story before we could start moving again. That would, that would send me for a bit of a loop, quite frankly. I would... I think I would probably find myself on the news. But I would never be caught doing that in New York because they have good public transportation, so I would just take the subway instead. Based, based, based. <laughs> good is a generous term? I feel like public transit in New York is good, right? Right? Also, you wouldn't need a court-appointed anger management counselor? Well, that's the thing about the movie is that neither did Adam Sandler. It was all a big mix-up because he got... Um, listen, to understand this, you have to understand the climate of post-9-11 America, uh, especially when it comes to aviation travel, okay? So Adam Sandler's on the airplane, and he wants to watch the movie, but he didn't get a headset. So he pings the stewardess and says, excuse me, can I please get a headset? And then she says, yeah, sure, no problem. And then he just catches her. Get on. You're not dead yet. He catches her um, just talking with her, with her co-workers instead of actually getting him his headset. So he says, excuse me, how about I get my headset? And then she says, don't yell at me, sir. This is a very hard time for our country right now. And then he says, I'm, in the quietest voice possible, he says, I'm not yelling. I just want my headset. And then an air marshal comes up and uh, says, excuse me, sir, do we have a problem here? And he said, no problem. I just want my headset. And then, well, it escalates from there. I don't want to spoil the whole movie for you, but... You can check it out for yourself if you have Canadian Netflix. I watched this clip in a workplace training program for emotional intelligence. There's no way. That can't possibly be true. What would that teach you about emotional intelligence? The whole point of this scene was that Adam Sandler is being reasonable and he's being gaslit into thinking that he's, uh, that he's got an anger management problem, but he's actually like a relatively laid back guy, except when he kicks the crap out of John C. Riley at that monastery. His wife set the whole thing up because he had repressed anger and she was concerned. Wait a minute, I haven't finished the second half of the movie yet, you jerk! It was all a Marissa Tomei-esque ruse? I mean, I saw it once when my parents rented it from the video store a long time ago, but... I'm sorry, I didn't know. Well, now you know! It's alright, I think we're past the window for spoilers. You can pet the chicken! The movie did come out... 20 years ago, and it's bad. So, I think if a movie is good or great, the spoiler window is like five years. If I'm assuming it's not like, hey, come to my movie club and discuss Barbie, and then you're like, whoa, whoa, spoiler, you know? Like, if you're not actively seeking out spoilers, I feel like the spoiler window is like five years. If a movie's bad, I think the spoiler window is like the second the film comes out. Any plans to accidentally show your penis on stream? Well, listen. I don't think you can have a plan to accidentally do something. Genius. I understand the reference to what you're talking about. <laughs> no, please, I like this stream. If I see your dong, I don't think I could come back. Listen. The odds of me accidentally hanging dong on stream are pretty low. Let me explain the reasons why. Um, one of, silence, I kill you. Um, one of the reasons is because I don't wear boxers to begin with. So, I believe from the clip, the problem is that the streamer in question is wearing boxers. Um, and the boxers always have like a fly on the front of them, which is a real problem because the fly allows, uh, uh, allows for your thing to, in theory, flop out, okay? So A, that's not going to happen to me because I'm, I'm wearing boxer briefs. It's a, it's a different setup. 
Secondly, on top of the boxer briefs, I'm wearing some shorts right now. Thirdly, I'm just, just to be quite frank with you, I'm not embarrassed about it, but I'm not dealing with the kind of twig and two berries that if I engaged in some gyration, it's not gonna snake its way out of the, the fly. It's, it's well affixed to my, my pubic area. It's now, let me put it this way. I always know where it is. I'm never like, where's this thing going? I always know where it's, where it's at, because it's always in the same spot. Everybody on Earth has like, you know, lost a testicle at some point. It goes up in your abdomen or like slides behind the other one and you're like, whoa, 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 there it is. I've never lost chain of custody on my cock. It's always right where I left it. So I, I think that it's, it's a, I've previously thought it was a curse, but maybe it's also a blessing in some ways. My balls disappear all the time. I'm not joking. I know you're not joking. People don't understand, man. It's, it's easy to lose a testicle in this day and age. Zippers are ruthless. Are you talking about getting the beans above the frank? How'd you get the beans above the frank? I've never gotten the beans above the frank. You ever had testicular torsion? Uh, well, a rival wizard tried to cast testicular tor torsion on me once, but the joke was on him because it was my decoy testicles. Smart move. <laughs> I guess there's like more of the level that I'm just ignoring. Dialogue in this game is kind of questionable. Listen, all I'm saying... People aren't ready for this take yet, and I understand why. No game should have dialogue. Maybe that's too far. Maybe Disco Elysium should have dialogue. No other game has, has earned the right yet. No, NL, you don't understand the writing in Baldur's Gate 2. Listen, are you an industry plant? Right, did Macros put you up to this? No game should have quipping, maybe, is what I mean to say. Because the we're now we're in such an anti-quip phase in media. Your quipping has to be immaculate in order to not get raked over the coals, okay? So I'm, it's more like for your own self-interest. I'm telling you now, this is not the time in the media climate when you want to be quipping. Quipping is very risky. But everything in life has a balance. Because if you go back and you look at like reviews of the first Avengers movie and stuff like that, or anything Joss Whedon has ever made, they got like highly overrated I guess everything, well not everything, but I guess a lot of things in media are a reaction to what's like the dominant theme at the time, right? Perhaps there's, there was the opinion that dialogue took itself too seriously in that period. So Joss Whedon's self-aware, you know, winks and nods during Buffy the Vampire Slayer felt like a breath of fresh air. Nowadays, every single... Uh, modern, at least superhero movie, seems to ape that style of dialogue, so it seems very cringeworthy. We're, we're, we're overdosing on it. Hey, don't give me this! Give me this! Don't kill me! Don't give me this! Give me this! Here's what you got for me. One of those, then you get surprised. I've followed it up with nothing. I didn't think you could reach me with that one. Okay, okay, try it again. Won't be the last time I am on hard mode. Thank you for thank you for asking a question that allowed me to respond in the affirmative. I mean, I'm not at a stage in my life where I'm choosing to play any game on normal. Because dying in most games is more fun than living. You know, I was thinking about it. I, I don't have a... This is not an action item. But I was thinking about difficulty in game design. And I, I think it's a useful model to think about why I bounce off of so many games. It's almost like having your car or your bike in the wrong gear. Like, for example, a game that is too easy feels like you're, you're pedaling your bicycle, but the bicycle is stuck in, like, first gear. So you're like, yeah, it's really easy to move the bicycle, but it's not satisfying. 
and the, the bike isn't going fast. I don't feel like I'm, I'm close. I got a connection with the pedals or anything like that. Sure, I can spin my wheels really fast. But at the same time, it's just not satisfying. And then, like, games that are way too hard, which for me, the example that I have is, like, crop rotation this week. I was, like, every pedal stroke feels like my quads and hamstrings are going to explode. Like, just to move six inches on the bicycle, I feel like I'm, I'm going to end up having muscle spasms tomorrow. But when you get a game that's like, this is very, very close to like that perfect gear right now, where I'm like, pedaling is not easy, but at the same time, it's not so difficult as to feel that it's impossible. And sometimes the difficulty is like, oh, the enemies have too much HP. Sometimes the difficulty is just like, there's too many fucking mechanics, bro. <laughs> In my world, at least. I can't speak for your world, because I don't know who you are or what you're about. What's a game that's too easy? Can I say something that's constructive criticism without being, um, without having people descend upon me? I sort of feel like there's a lot of examples of like three out of ten games that are too easy. But right now, the last time I played Thronefall, I was like, possibly this game is a little bit too easy. The fact that I was not forming a coherent strategy throughout the round and still won, I was like, that didn't hit the flywheel for me. There's modifiers that make it tough. They should make the modifiers the base game then, in my opinion. No, they shouldn't add more mechanics. They should just make it harder. Not harder to learn. <laughs> Isn't that the appeal of the game? Some of you motherfuckers have minimalism confused with difficulty. You can have a very easy game with complex mechanics. For example, play Europa Universalis 4 as France. You can also have a very, a, a, a relatively difficult game with simple mechanics. Into the Breach or something like that. These, these are great examples. Tetris, great example. Now this, it's not related to this, because this is hitting the sweet spot right now as far as I'm concerned. Like, watch this. Ain't nothing difficult about that, but it is satisfying. So this must be the new Assassin's Creed. What the uh, it can't be, because I don't know where to go. And in Assassin's Creed, I always know where to go, because they put a big diamond on your on your map, which is very helpful for idiots like me, but also emblematic of many of the things wrong with modern game design and everyone else's opinion. I agree there shouldn't be a big diamond, but I also think that I should never get lost. I think if I ever get lost in a game, you've designed the game badly. Can I tell you something embarrassing as well? I've previously been on record as saying it's crazy how many Assassin's Creed fans I see in public, like at least a couple times a month. I'll see someone wearing like a shirt or a hat with the Assassin's Creed logo on it. I don't see that much other gaming merch outside of like conventions. So I was like, where did all these Assassin's Creed fans come from? Not my ass in Disney Springs, realizing there's a store called Volcom and their logo is exactly the same as the Assassin's Creed logo. And that's what everyone's actually wearing. I thought there were just a ton of Assassin's Creed fans out there. <laughs> it turns out there's a, there's a brand that copped their logo. Or maybe Assassin's Creed copped their logo, I don't know. That was my jam in middle school. I, I don't know what to tell you, I just, I simply did not know. It's a triangle, man. I mean, it's not a triangle. It's a, I don't even know, it's like a, a diamond with triangles inside of it. It looks like the tip of a fountain pen. Exactly. Where do I go, man? Would you use a bidet if it was hooked up to a Sprite keg? I'd say yeah. If water is good for cleaning your you-know-what, then Sprite must be amazing, right? Because it's like water plus like another ingredient. Bleach, maybe? Can I tell you something crazy? Do you know how bent over the corporations have us? We moved, right? When we moved, we inherited the washing machine from the house. We left our washing machine in our old place. We didn't need to get a washing machine because there was already a washing machine in this place, okay? No problem. I've used many different washing machines in my life. Maytag, Whirlpool, Frigidaire, et cetera, et cetera. 
This washing machine must be newer. You know how I know it's newer? Because it has a subscription service. Now, you don't have to pay $9.99 a month to use your washing machine. However, on the washing machine, it has a logo on it that says, make sure to clean your washer with a, a fresh. And I said, what is that? I'm going to ignore it. Well, <laughs> after ignoring it for a month, it plays like an alarm. And every time you try to run a cycle in your washing machine, it's like, just so you know, you should really clean your washer with a fresh. It makes the light like blink at you and tries to like default to that setting. So we said, I don't want to ruin my washing machine. We bought a fresh. A fresh is literally just like these pucks of bleach. They recommend you clean your washing machine with this. Uh, you run a cycle on washer clean with a fresh in it once a month. Otherwise, the thing will ignore the heck out of you or uh, annoy the heck out of you, I should say. How much was it? I don't, the point is not the price. It's the principle, man. Why do I have to wash the washing machine? The washing machine, the only things that go into it are like water and soap. Literally every time it works, it cleans. But that soap's not good enough. That, no, you've got to get a soap to wash the residue of the laundry soap off of the washing machine. Doesn't make any damn sense. I just, I, I can't believe we've reached the point in life where I, once a month I have to clean my washing machine with a different kind of soap, okay? Like, where does it end? I guess it ends with the cleaning your washing machine because there's like nowhere else to go. <laughs> But it should have ended before that. We should make washing machines that don't need to be cleaned. You should YouTube dirty washing machine repair to see how dirty they can get. They can get absolutely disgusting. I believe it. I'm just resentful. Because it feels like everything's a subscription service now. We had a washing machine in our old place for five years. We never cleaned it. Our clothes came out smelling a little bit mildewy, but that's the way the world works, man. <laughs> we do clean our dishwasher. We don't have a garbage disposal, which sucks because having a garbage disposal is really nice, but we do clean our dishwasher. But that's because like food gets stuck in there. I don't throw like a plate with, you know, taco beef on it into the washing machine. Now, I, I want you because you're going to be like upset. I also rinse off the taco beef before I put the plate in the dishwasher. But at the same time, I'm telling like so, there's always some residue. You know, there's more residue on the on the plates than there is on the on the clothes. Don't you clean soap scum off of your shower? Here's the thing, I do, but I wouldn't if um, my wife didn't want me to. Like I get that you should clean the soap off of your, the soap scum off of your shower. Or wait, maybe I don't even, now that I think about it. Hang on, I gotta think about where we're going here. Maybe like a blue baby. Isaac reference! Isaac reference! Because I feel like, what, what's the problem with soap scum? You may say it's unsightly, and there may be some truth to that. My response to that is I simply choose not to notice it. But soap residue is not dirty, right? Like, it's soap. Isn't it constructed in such a way that, like, dirt can't touch it? It's from your dirt, though? Well, no, because my dirt's getting washed down the drain. Where it's then being stopped briefly in the in the drain because the hair trap is full of body hair that ambiently fell off my body while I was showering. Same logic that the towel you use to dry yourself can't get dirty because you were clean when you dried yourself? No, 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 no. That's the, the, the people who think that are stupid, okay? And the reason that people think that are stupid is that there's ambient mold and yeast in the air. So it, when, it, when anything gets damp, there's mold everywhere mold congregates into the dampness and that's why you have to you have to clean your shower okay or sorry that's why you have to clean your towel but the shower doesn't get moldy explain that mold can't grow on ceramics it can only grow on softer substrates such as towels and uh foods breads in particular 
like soap scum. Why? Well, I'm just saying I, I'm, I'm not just trying to be absurd. There's a little absurdity here, but I kind of reject the notion that like soap scum is is dirt. I, I'm still sort of struggling with the idea that soap can be dirty. I suppose the shower does get moldy. That's why we clean it, brother. I'm telling you, we clean. So like this is. I'm just telling you, I live in a clean house. But even when I lived on my own. My shower was not getting moldy. Are you showering inside of a shower made of, of whole wheat bread? My shower's moldy right now. My caulk is moldy. That sounds like you need to speak to a urologist, brother. That seems like a real problem. Has Kate been taking care of it? We, we both clean. You heteronormative so-and-so. We do! She cleans more. That's a given. <laughs> I'm gonna need some men to back me up here, okay? Why is it a given? Here's why it's a given. She cleans more. It's not because I'm like a slob. It's because genuinely, I swear to God, I notice it less. I know that seems like an excuse, but you watch me play the game we just played, right? I'm not that detail-oriented, okay? Now, when things are untidy, that you, you, this will shock you, perhaps. But here's what happened. Every night, we eat dinner. After dinner's done, I take all the dishes, I take the pots, I take the pans, I put them into the sink. I scrape off any residue that's on the countertops, I might even clean the stove, right? Then I do the dishes myself. If, there's, if the dishwasher's full and, and clean, I put them all back in where they're supposed to go. Every night, I, I, I deal with, not as much as my wife, but I deal with untidiness and, and I clean up the house, okay? That being said, other stuff like, hey, the bathroom is dirty. I, I tend not to see that stuff as much, you know? I, I think of it almost the same way I think about when your glasses get dirty. If your glasses went from perfectly clean to dirty, like hideous immediately, you would be like, oh my God, my glasses are dirty. But what happens is they get like 1% dirtier like every six hours, and it's, it's the frog in the pot of boiling water. You know, if something, the kitchen goes from perfectly clean to very untidy in the natural process of dinner being cooked. But when stuff just ambiently, like the sim style, gets 2% dirtier per day or something like that, it's a lot harder to notice that you're like, hey, this is dirty. So I need someone to tell me. And sometimes rather than tell me, my wife would rather be like, I just cleaned it which is good, I, I, I'm happy for that as well. But that's my defense for why I probably do less cleaning than my wife. That's, I'm, I'm just to my own self, I'm being true. I'm also being very offended, by the way, because people are saying, you seem like a, a maid type person. I'm not a maid type person at all. I'm very, we, we had a housekeeping service come in like once every two weeks or once a week for maybe a year. I was always very embarrassed because you're, you're, it's a poison pill, okay? Because either you sit and stream while the housekeeper is clean, which makes me feel guilty for having an untidy house. That feels bad. Or I have housekeepers come in and clean, and I'm too embarrassed to be there, so like I go out and I miss a whole bunch of work, and then also I have to pay them way too much money. So I'm like, I would rather just clean on the weekend, make sure the place looks nice, and then also like work on the week. I'm, I'm not anti-housekeeper. <laughs> Hang on, I know what I said, okay? I'm not anti-housekeeper. I'm simply, I, I feel like it doesn't work for me. I understand why, why people do it, for sure. Because like if you, maybe you have a job where you don't have to, maybe you're in the office, for example, and then people can come to your house and clean, and you don't like cleaning. There you go. That's a, a good use of your, your financial resources, I would say. For me personally, it's, it's a poison pill. Because either I have to feel bad and pay money, or I have to miss work and pay money. Neither of which appeal to me. I'm going to try a Royal Flycatcher build. You ever use the Roomba? Same problem. The, the Roomba... I'm not saying it's hard to be a streamer. Like, not in the slightest. You killed my flycatcher! You don't know what I've gone through to have to get one, man. But Roomba is... Uh, uh, too loud. Thank you for taking the words out of my mouth. 
it's too loud if you have a job where you have to be on the microphone. And also, it's an inefficient vacuumer. You probably already knew that because it's a robot. But like when a normal person vacuums, they just vacuum every spot like once and then they're done. The Roomba just kind of bounces around until it, you know, I don't, I don't even know when the Roomba stops. I guess either when you program it to stop or when you, uh, when it senses no dirt. I run mine at 3 a.m. I mean, I, again, I have to just go back to someone in chat who said, why are you trying to min-max vacuuming? I'm 100% I'm with you. Vacuuming is like, I don't want to call it the easiest chore because it's my wife does it. <laughs> so it, it's just honestly rude for me to say that. Like vacuuming is not the hardest part of, of keeping something tidy, man. I don't know why people want me to have like lived in a... I'm, I'm trying to think of what word you would use. Like a frat house or something like that? I'm... I'm not as tidy as mouth, but after almost 10 years of being married to a very tidy person, I've naturally become much tidier. I'm, I have a pretty tidy setup, especially like I think by streamer standards. <laughs> I don't know if it's because you want me to be a slob, so you got somebody to relate to or what, then I apologize for getting into personal attacks here, but you did it first. No, it's the opposite. You seem like a clean person, and it's surprising to find out you're not. What do you mean I'm not? I am a clean person. How often do you... <laughs> how often do you clean the soap scum off of your shower? We do it like once a month. If I wasn't married, I would probably do it once every six months. But I'm, I rarely notice my shower getting dirty, man. I say rarely. What I mean is never. Once a month for me? Once a month. It, some people out here are like... Oh, I change my sheets once a month, but I clean my shower once a week? Brother, you're not sleeping on the shower wall. So, like, explain to me how you got your priorities so backwards. You're wearing the same jeans for six months straight, but meanwhile, you have to clean the walls of your shower once a week, otherwise you're disgusting. Yeah, sure. You're not supposed to wash denim. You're not supposed to wash denim. Hang on, we're about to get a 10-piece as well. While, while going through this insane dialogue. If you shower at night, is it more acceptable to clean your sheets less? I don't have the patience for this kind of discourse, okay? This is, this is a younger man's way of streaming and I'm, I'm just, I'm past it. You should just do the, you don't have to do a spreadsheet in advance and say, I know you're supposed to change your sheets every two weeks, but at the same time I shower at night, so I'm gonna do every three weeks instead. You should just, has it been a while since I changed the sheets? Let's change the sheets. Who cares? Maybe sometimes that's 13 days. Maybe sometimes it's 27 days. You know, you know when you look at your sheets, you go, these sheets need to be washed. Just like, you don't have to, it, I, I look at it kind of like showering, you know? I normally shower once a day. Sometimes I shower twice a day. What makes, it, what makes me shower once a day versus twice a day? Does my ass stink? If I'm stinking it up, then I'm taking two showers. I'm not gonna step out to like a nice dinner with my wife and then she's gonna be like, oh, you kind of smell, can you take a shower first? And I'll be like, sorry, I'm a one shower a day Andy and I already used my, my, my privileges, you know? You just do it when it needs to be done. And maybe there's some days where you go out there and good for you, you wake up and you say, I still smell like yesterday's deodorant then maybe you don't need to shower that day. I would still do it just to sort of build up the, the accumulative benefit of it, but maybe that's just me speaking. Okay, now listen here. I'm lucky if I get two showers a week, but I work a desk job and I rarely sweat. Okay. I trust you, okay? I trust you that you don't stink. You may stink, but I'm choosing to trust that you don't, okay? But I do want to take issue with one thing. And the only thing I'm going to take issue with is why did you phrase it like, I'm lucky if I get to take two showers a week? Because you're in my chat. So you got time. <laughs> this is like the, and I love Robert. This is not an anti-Robert bit. It's, it's just funny. But the time that Robert 
I mean, the stream, the NLSS started at 5 p.m. Eastern time, and he would show up and be like, I didn't have time to eat before the stream, or like, I didn't have time to go to the bathroom today. And I'm like, what are you talking about? It's 5 p.m. Eastern time right now. You don't, you need to take some time for yourself in that situation. You need to carve out time to take more showers if you, if you love them. You ever try a cold shower? I have. Um, I am not for them. A cool shower maybe on a, on a really hot day, but a cold shower, even, even if it's, I mean, let me put it this way. Even when we were in Orlando, I was showering with hot water. It never ends. Oh my God. <laughs> well, the Royal Flycatcher is amazing. Can I show you something that's gonna irritate you? Remember this, okay? Royal Flycatcher, 10 wins, level 2.667 repeating, of course. Okay, are you ready for this? Royal Flycatcher, I've never gotten one to uh, level three, 10 wins. You had so much chocolate, I know. But the, the, the Royal Flycatcher wasn't doing anything, so I was like, oh, we won't give him the chocolate. But my priorities were wrong. I, this is from chat. I would think of it this way. I wouldn't wash my dishes in cold water, so why would I wash my body in cold water? It's an interesting way to think about it. Can I tell you something? This story haunts me. There's a, there's a few... I think everybody has these. I'm not making this part of my neuroatypical arc. I think everybody has a couple stories like this. The story pre preceding the story, because it's in the same genre, is one time I had a, an office job and uh, one of the other workers came by. I was just like a, I was a 19 year old kid that they hired for the summer, right? So they didn't really know who I was. And neither did I at that point in my life. But uh, someone, one of the other workers came by my office and dropped something off. And then I, when they dropped it off, I said like, all right. And then they said, um, oh, do I detect an Australian accent? To which I should have said no. But what I said was, uh, I don't think so. And I'll tell you in my own defense, the reason I said I don't think so is because the question was, do I detect an Australian accent? And I don't know, you tell me, lady, what you detected. But I don't have one, but maybe you detected it, okay? That was just, I, I took her question too literally and I'll own up to that. But then she said, oh, are your parents from Australia? And I said, I was like panicking and I said, I don't think so again. And then she just went, oh, okay. And then she walked out. So she definitely thought at, that I was either like <laughs> not very smart or that I was like an Australian orphan or something like that. Then another one that got me was I was in the work kitchen, different coworker by the way, but I was in the work kitchen and I was washing off a plate and this guy came in and said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm doing the dishes. And he said, why are you doing it with cold water? And I was embarrassed because in my head I was like, oh, duh, you use hot water to clean the dishes. And I said, oh, you know, climate change and all that. Dude definitely left thinking I was a complete moron. <laughs> Using 10 times as much water to clean the dishes because you don't want to turn on the burner for two seconds to get hot water to clean the dishes so much more efficiently. Oh, man. I used to get your attention with every message. Now I don't get a look in. Is it because I'm not funny? Let's see, slash user, SOS, Chuck. Let me take a look here. Tier one sub for 20 months, one timeout from Nightbot. That's no timeouts. <clears throat> okay, last message. Do you not rapidly shag your dishes in a mass before humping them in a, I'm not even reading these words because I don't know what they are. This is Flycatcher Weekly. Cold showers made my wife like me. She yaddle on my saber till I Yoda. LAX is a bloated hellscape. Shaving Ryan's privates. I can't. <laughs> None of these, these are good messages. You shouldn't, listen. 
not every um, good message gets read, but those are good messages. You should not feel bad about those. You're, you're adding to the ecosystem, okay? Those are funny messages. And I support them. You know what I also didn't call out in your audit that, I, that I'm very respectful of? You're one of the only chatters I've ever seen, and I count myself in that, in that group. You're one of the only chatters I've ever seen that has the courage to make a joke, and if the streamer doesn't read it, you don't make the exact same joke again. And that's crazy. To have the intestinal fortitude to make what you think is a good joke, have it get no attention and not spam it is a level of self-control that we should all aspire to, in my opinion. And you're not an emote spammer. Now, I love emote spammers, don't get me wrong. But I, I, I also, I respect that all the jokes were, were original. That's a good way of thinking about it. Sometimes jokes are for other chatters. Not just for the, uh, the streamer to draw attention to. It's a mature mindset. Now, I disagree. <laughs> Maybe for you, for me personally. NL, what's stopping you from fully leaning into the finance streamer arc? There's multiple things, okay? One of them is um, the size of the market. A lot of people have not gotten the memo that we're basically back in a bull market. You know, in 2021, when things were peaking and all assets were rising like 70% annually, everybody and their shoe shiner got really into finance. So the, the appetite for content got really high. Right now, not so much. People are still like, there's gonna be a recession, everything's gonna collapse. If the S&P 500 goes up like another 500, 600 points, people will be back, but it's still, I, I think that the market's kind of small, smaller. Anyway, on top of that, once you get to the point where, where you, said, you said bull, do you mean bear? I mean bull. Why, why don't you go look at where the S&P 500 was in uh, August 2022 and then tell me what it's at right now. That means it's a bear market, not a bull. No, we have bear sentiment, but we're back in a bull market, baby. We shrugged off the bear. Not me. I haven't been buying stocks lately because we bought a house, but like we'll be back there. Anyway, regardless, subtract Apple. I don't have to subtract Apple, motherfucker, because I own the index. I own a basket. Why would I subtract? It's like literally getting your grocery basket, buying eight loaves of bread and being like, you didn't get that much food. If you, if you take the bread out of it, you didn't get that much food. Yeah, well, the bread makes up 7% of the index, so I'm not subtracting the damn bread. Part of the reason I bought the basket is because it has so much fucking bread in it. And everybody that you see outside is holding a bun. Whether they're on the bus, walking, talking. Anyway, the other thing is once you read Burden Malkiel's A Random Walk Down Wall Street, you realize there's no point in making finance con content because it's solved. I still listen to finance podcasts, but I don't even know why. Like, and now I've reached the point where I started listening to finance podcasts for finance information, and now I just listen to it because I like the dudes that host it. And then every week they're like, is the market up? Is it down? We don't really care, but <laughs> did you watch any good movies this week? Do they do Peloton anecdotes, though? Ironically, maybe it's not ironic. Coincidentally, they do sometimes, <laughs> which is, yes, it's funny. This rant came from a chatter asking if you're not a finance streamer. It wasn't a rant. I was just, it was humorous. That was, that was faux anger. Although I will admit it got the blood pumping a little bit when somebody said subtract Apple. Oh, the breadth of the, oh yeah, sure. The, the index is up 935%, but if you take out the best 25 performing stocks, then it's flat on the year. Okay. That's why you don't buy individual securities. Jesse Livermore, like, get a life. <laughs> get a life doesn't really apply there. Oh, come on, come on. S&P's only up 2% since last August. Listen, motherfucker. Okay, take it from June instead. You're cherry picking just like the guy who said get rid of Apple? Hey, listen. That's true. <laughs> But I'm on the right side of the cherry pick, so it feels damn good. Did you guys see the chart um, retweeted by Jason Zweig from the Wall Street Journal that was originally released by a private equity fund, and it showed uh, the historical returns versus volatility 
for all asset classes from 1980 to 2022. And then it had private equity at like the highest. But then in the footnotes, it said, please note this data has removed 2008 and 2009 from the sample because they were outliers. Oof. Malcolm Gladwell pilled when the, <laughs> when the data doesn't agree with your conclusion, simply throw it away. Kip Casper, hey Anel, I just knocked out a huge 925 over 60 minutes on a Matt Wilpers endurance ride, motherfucker. See, Kip Casper, here's where you're pissing me off, okay? First off, congratulations. I'm trying to run, so that's an average over 90 minutes, no, 60 minutes. That's an average of like 460 kilojoules per 30 minutes, which is like a fucking like 250 watt average for an hour, which is crazy. But if you remove Apple from that, it's nothing. <laughs> but also isn't a power zone endurance ride supposed to be almost entirely in zone one and zone two? A power zone max ride, I could see you hitting numbers like that. But power isn't power zone endurance just uh, two and three usually. Oh, okay. I guess zone one is just like if you have a heart attack on the bike. Hello, Luca. <laughs> this one's for those ice cold Michelle Pfeiffer, the white gold. This one's for the good girls. Them hood girls, straight masterpieces. Styling, flying, living it up in the city. Got the Saint Laurent with the chucks on. I gotta kiss myself, I'm so pretty. It's too hot, hot darn. Make a dragon wanna retire, man. Too hot. I'm too hot. Say my name, you know who I am, I'm too hot. Girls hit your hallelujahs. Girls hit your hallelujahs. Girls hit your hallelujahs. Cause uptown funk gonna give it to you. Cause uptown funk gonna give it to you. Cause uptown funk gonna give it to you. Saturday night and we're in the spot. Don't believe me, just watch. Yeah, I do. It's the that song comes up a lot on the Peloton. <laughs> like a lot. <laughs> like all the time. I forgot so your shaver is this big. I was wondering what that was. This is just I'm not gonna put it on the on the stream. But there was a, a a vinyl bag in my bathroom that said, Trust us, your vagina will thank you. And I didn't put it there, and I didn't have the nerve to look inside and see what it was. <laughs> but that, that is my, that's an electric razor. Oh, man. The, the bag was for the after oh. giving birth. Oh, like, yeah. You use it to like. Oh, uh, man. Just... That is really good. <laughs> Hey, Anel, have you started drinking your child's blood yet? No, I think I'm just going to be one of those, like, 45-year-olds who is, like, looks 45 instead of one of those 45-year-olds who looks 42. I'm okay with that. I saw the... Because that guy, you can't ignore him on social media, right? The guy who... He, he was a second employee at Venmo, made a lot of money from, like selling the company. And then he's like, here's how I lower my epigenetic age. And I'm just gonna be honest with you, that's just too much work for me to lower. I don't even know what an epigenetic age is, but like, it's just too much. Changing my diet, sure. I, he takes like 70 pills a day. I'm not willing to do it. I'm not even gonna it, like, insult him by saying something like, Life isn't worth living at that point. It's just a trade that I'm unwilling to. I'm unwilling to do, quite frankly. Would I, would I go vegetarian or vegan? Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. I, I said yeah really quick, but I'd honestly have to think about it. <laughs> Please, one up. Oh, so you're saying there's a chance? But I'm not doing a blood transfusion with the. Uh, you know, with my 
child or something. It's just too much, man. I'm just... Don't shoot me. Oh, <laughs> wait, no, I'm alive. Oh, bring me back. No! Oh! <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's pretty much it. I still had fun, though. Slash marker. Sap. You would be a big get for the vegan community? I think I would have a hard time with veganism. Vegetarianism I could do easily, though. I'm genuinely not one of those guys who's like, give me a steak, give me a hamburger. It, you know, when you're in Rome, of course, do what the Romans do. But like, I, I like soups and stews and salads. My problem, and I, I don't mean this to be anti-vegan, but I'm just, as someone who eats everything, I know that it gets easier every few years to be vegan because the substitutions get better, but they're, most of them are still not very good. I've never had a good vegan cheese. I've only had maybe like three or four of them, but like the Beyond Burger and the Impossible Burger are both pretty good, actually. I would have no problem eating just Beyond Burgers instead of hamburgers for the rest of my life. But the problem is I don't even like hamburgers that much. L.A. has some great vegan food. Yeah, but I don't want to eat at a LA, downtown L.A. restaurant every night. I got to get some... <laughs> I got to be able to cook like some soft tacos in my own house and I'm not having soft tacos without cheese in Mexico they don't put cheese I don't live in Mexico okay I'm gonna make the Minnesota style tacos okay with the shredded cheddar cheese and the olives in them or something like that I could easily go pescatarian I mean that's a that's a gimme I just for me it would I mean you could do anything right you could just eat bread for the rest of your life until you die or something like that but like, if I had to go vegan, I could do it. But I do rely a lot on cheese. I eat a lot of cheese. It's just such an obvious, like, quick, relatively healthy snack. You got two minutes, eat a little bit of cheese. It's calorically dense. I'm not a huge egg guy, but obviously eggs are, like, an ingredient in a lot of things, which would make it really tough to be vegan. I think what I could do is I could be one of those guys who's like, I'm vegan in spirit. I try to eat vegan as much as I can, but when I'm at a restaurant, I'm not going to ask you if the, if the ragu has, well, I guess the ragu literally is a meat sauce, but... <laughs> you know what I mean. I'm not going to ask you if the sauce has like, um, you know, Pecorino Romano in it. Because it's, if you're going vegan for the spirit of it, instead of just to adhere to the guidelines, maybe you're, you're willing to have a little bit of flexibility. I'm excited Mathis might be moving to Washington at some point. You know what that means? I'll be like, oh my God, we live so close to each other, we should come visit. And then I'll probably won't see him for like seven or eight years. <laughs> Seems to be what happens. If I have friends who move to Vancouver, I see them. But usually they're only here to do like a, you know, grad school or something like that. But I have a lot of friends who ended up, you know, in Washington for work. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm up here in Vancouver. We should totally grab dinner. And then like five years later, I see them like, oh, I live in Austin, Texas now. And I'm like, what the fuck? Why were you dogging on crustaceans yesterday? What, what do you mean? Why was I dogging on crustaceans yesterday? You talking about how I said in the Hamul Pajon? I don't. I, I get down with the octopus and the squid and stuff, but I'm not that big into the other mollusks. I believe I said mollusks specifically. There's just a few too many mussels and clams on it. Like, I, I would rather have, like, one more... Uh, uh, I was going to say obstacle? One more octopus tentacle, and you could cut a couple of clams off of the Hemul Pajon or something like that. It's not that big of a deal. Hello, Luca. This one's for those ice cold Michelle Pfeiffer, the white gold. This one's for the good girls, them hood girls, straight masterpieces. Styling, flying, living it up in the city. Got the Saint Laurent with the chucks on. I gotta kiss myself, I'm so pretty. It's too hot, hot darn. Make a dragon wanna retire, man. Too hot, I'm too hot. 
say my name, you know who I am, I'm too hot. Girls hit your hallelujahs. Girls hit your hallelujahs. Girls hit your hallelujahs. Cause uptown funk gonna give it to ya. Cause uptown funk gonna give it to ya. Cause uptown funk gonna give it to ya. Saturday night can move in the spot. Don't believe me, just watch. I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, I do. It's the. It. That song comes up a lot on the Peloton. <laughs> like a lot. <laughs> like all the time.